curious what other reference ranges Peter considers too soft. Okay, so this is sort of on the heels of the last podcast or the last AMA where I talked about my blood values before, during, and after the fast. Yeah. Um, so because I don't remember what I actually talked about, I'll just probably just start from scratch and there might be some repetition here. So um, as I just sort of think about going through the labs from start to finish, when it comes to the lipids, I generally um, take a harder line on triglycerides than is typically given. So the typical reference range on triglyceride is less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. I apologize, I don't know what that is in millimolar for people who are outside of the United States. Um, I, I generally like to see triglycerides below 100. Um, and if we're really gonna get fancy, I'd like to see triglycerides lower than HDL cholesterol when both are measured in milligrams per deciliter. Mm. So again, that's probably a bit more of a stringent, um, you know, sort of uh, level that I would put on things, but that that's sort of the first place I think about it. Um, secondly, looking at the LDL particle number, which is measured in animal per liter, um, just morally and philosophically, I feel like that number ought to be below a thousand nanomol per liter, which is the, about the 20th percentile of the population. And the reason I feel that way is, um, you know, heart disease and atherosclerotic disease are the most ubiquitous causes of death. So to be average on the disease that is the most common strikes me as uh, just backwards mathematics. So you have mm. to, you really do need some alpha when it comes to a metric like that. And I know that there's gonna be some people watching this that are saying, oh my God, LDL, this, all this controversy. Um, I don't know when this podcast is gonna come out in relation to the discussion that I had with Dave Feldman about this and the discussion with Tom Dayspring. So either by the time you're listening to this, Hopefully that point will have been long addressed. And if not, I assure you it will be addressed. So it might make sense to define what reference ranges are because I think people might get confused with what is average and what is optimal. Mm -hmm. And so people might look at, I don't know, that two thirds of the country is overweight and or Great obese. Great point. Um, and so when you look at the average, it's gonna be different from what is actually either normal or healthy. Yeah, so thanks for bringing that up. So reference yeah. ranges are usually given um, around a population distribution, but it evolves over time. So if you went and looked at a laboratory test from 25 years ago and you looked at in the same units for the same variable, you know, for example, ALT or AST, the uh, uh, transaminases, you would see different numbers. And all that's telling you is every few years, the labs have to kind of update their reference range on what they're seeing in the population. So for some things like hormones, you're often going to see you know, between X and Y. And any lab will tell you upon asking, they usually don't print this on the lab, but we go back and usually ask them, what do your reference ranges represent? And it's usually, either 10th to 20th percentile to 80th to 90th percentile or two standard deviations below the mean to two standard deviations above the mean. And again, that's usually something they could only say if the data approximate a normal distribution, mm -hmm. which many of these things do, uh, just like height, for example. So you could report height as you know the uh, average height or the you know interquartile range. So the uh, you know 25th to 75th percentile of height I'm making this up if for a male in the United States would be you know I don't know five foot eight to five foot eleven and a half but of course if you're asking a separate question which is if you're trying to optimize to be a rower a heavyweight rower you know someone mm -hmm. who rows crew uh, you'd obviously want to be probably between six foot two and six foot four again I'm making that up but the point is showing you that you would pick a range that's completely outside of the statistical norm because you're optimizing for something very particular, in that case, rowing. So um, I basically just disregard all the reference ranges when I look at labs and I kind of have my own set of standards that are based on my belief system around what should and shouldn't be the case physiologically. So again, going down that list after the LDL, I, I'd like to see the small LDLP below 500 nanomol per liter, um, which is represented by the 50th per, uh, 25th percentile, pardon me. Um, I like to see the oxidized LDL below 40. That's a very stringent criteria because most labs will acknowledge that anything below 60 is reasonable. I like to see that even lower. I like to see C-reactive protein below one. 
even though most labs consider anything below two reasonable. Um, kind of just kind of mentally scrolling through this, I like to see uric acid below 5.0. Again, most labs consider anything below six to be normal. Some, some labs even consider anything below seven to be normal. And again, I think in part that's because they're optimizing around the prevention of gout. Mm. And it's very unlikely you're gonna have a gout attack with a uric acid of 6.2. However, I think there are a number of other health consequences to that. Let's see. Um, Did you give ALT and AST? No. So ALT and AST, as of now, on the lab that I use, uh, the upper limit of ALT is 44, maybe 42, and AST is about 40. I think both of those are unnecessarily high, and we typically like to see patients below 20 on both of those. Um, uh, oral glucose tolerance test. You mentioned this, I think, maybe in the another AMA. You yeah. talked about the one hour, two hour, both insulin and glucose. Actually, you gave those. Right. So those uh, again, I don't know. I can't remember what the reference ranges are on our lab, but I know that they're geared primarily towards uh, a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. There was a day when you would use the OGTT to diagnose type 2 diabetes and not what we do today, which is rely on hemoglobin A1C. Um, I think the use of an OGTT is a better test. And I think the hemoglobin A1C is, is not a particularly helpful test. Um, so yeah, I generally like to see the fasting glucose below 90 milligrams per deciliter, the fasting insulin below six, and at one hour following a 75 gram glucola challenge. So this is a liquid glucose challenge. Again, if you change the way that you do the test, you have to you know, come up with a whole new set of reference ranges. Um, at one hour for a reasonably muscular male, I'd like to see the glucose below 120 or maybe at a max 130 milligrams per deciliter and the insulin below 20 or 30. Um, in a less muscular individual or in a woman who is just smaller, I will tolerate slightly higher levels. And at two hours, I like to see the glucose back down to below 100 milligrams per deciliter and the insulin ideally below 20 or... Um, potentially even only 2x what the one hour glucose was. So if the glucose at one hour was eight, to see it at 16 or less at two hours would be great. Hmm. Um, you know, on the hormone front, boy, it's complicated there because you're dealing with so many other issues, which include symptoms that go far and beyond just the numbers. But I, you know, if someone's TSH is between about 0.5 and 2.0, and their free T3 is above 3.0, and their reverse T3 is below 12, I find it very hard to see how they could have hypothyroidism um, regardless of the symptoms they have. And if they do have symptoms that sound and smell and feel like hypothyroidism, I'm generally searching much harder for another cause, which again is not to say you can't be fooled, I think you always can be. But that would be what I would consider sort of biochemically optimal for thyroid. And then, of course, I, I think it's probably too nuanced to get into a discussion of what happens when one or more of those is out of whack. How do you begin to make the diagnosis? And I, I've probably talked about this in the past, but, you know, the TSH is really only telling you about what the pituitary gland is seeing in terms of T3, uh, T4 to T4, T4 to T3 conversion. So that's telling you about the diiodinase in the brain that's making that distinction. Um, the free T3 is telling you how much peripheral T4 is being converted to T3, and then the reverse T3 is telling you how much peripheral T4 is being converted to reverse T3, which opposes T3. And so the reverse T3 opposes T3, and each of those has a completely different um, sort of cause. So again, probably a little more complicated, and maybe we'll save that for another AMA. That's a great conversation with a whiteboard. Yes, when you that, have that's, a that's a whiteboard discussion because I, I, I'm yeah. going to screw it up if I try to explain it without being able to show D1, D2, D3 as the diiodinases and all the hormones. Um, probably another whiteboard discussion then would be the, the male and female sex hormones. That's an mm. even more complicated pathway. Um, there are about nine things that we measure um, there, beginning with DHEA, FSH, LH, all the way to uh, dihydrotestosterone or DHT. Um, Again, these are hormones that are, sometimes we're looking to keep things below a certain level or above a certain level. Sometimes we're looking to keep things between a certain level. Um, I think for EPA and DHA, when we look at the red blood cell index of EPA, DHA, 
Um, I know this is a very messy topic and it's also something we're going to absolutely talk about on a future podcast. So I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole. I definitely want to have Bill Harris on the podcast to discuss that. Um, but I do like to see the EPA DHA index above about 8.5%. I used to sort of think anything above 8% was ideal. You know, frankly, now I let patients up to 10 and even sometimes 12% if they're not having any issues like nosebleeds or something like that. Um, but again, it's more complicated because that's just showing you the total EPA DHA. And in some patients, you really want to see that DHEA prefer preferentially higher versus the EPA. Um, and it does depend quite a bit on what which axis we're most worried about, whether it be the um, neurodegenerative axis, in which case the DHEA might be a little more important, or the atherosclerotic axis, in which the EPA might be more important. And of course, it all comes without saying, the source of that EPA and DHA is heavily uh, dependent on on sort of you know what you care about and, and what you're worried about. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the other ranges are kind of complicated. I, I, I've talked about it before, so I'll bring it up again. Desmosterol is a very important sterol that we measure. So we measure um, markers of cholesterol synthesis, uh, of which there are mainly two that can be measured commercially, and measures of cholesterol absorption, um, in addition to stanol production. So sterols and stanols are slightly different. They have a slightly different chemical composition. Um, I don't particularly have an interest in how high or low the stanols are or the phytosterols, um, but I use that very much so when making therapeutic interventions with lipids. But I do care about the desmosterol. Um, and I do, all things equal, if given the choice, like to see that above 0.5. Um, and the, the reason for that is um, potentially obscure, but, I, but I, I do have some concern about overly suppressing cholesterol synthesis, which is typically an issue in patients who are taking statins. If you over suppress cholesterol synthesis, um, I think in aggregate, there's, I meaning at the population level, this does not seem to pose a problem, but mm -hmm. at the individual level, I would exercise some caution. And so the desmosterol becomes a guidepost. Of course, that's all complicated because there are some medications that interfere with the enzyme that converts desmosterol into cholesterol. And so the whole thing becomes a bit challenging and you can't really interpret the level in that context. Let's see, did I forget anything? Mm, IGF. Oh yeah. yeah, that's a good one. IGF, boy, this is one where I've really changed my tune a lot over time. I, I used to be in the camp that said, you know, low IGF is best. And in an ideal world, everybody should be at or below the 50th percentile. And that's one where it's not even worth explaining what the numbers are because it varies so much by age that you just have to look at the table that gives you the IGF breakdown by age. But um, I actually no longer think that's the case. I really think that IGF should be cycled between high and low. And, you know, for example, like when I did my fast um, after seven days, my IGF was probably, you know, at the fifth to 10th percentile. <clears throat> Um, and it might rebound to the 80th percentile when I'm not fasting. And so I, I think it's, you know, I think epidemiology mostly sucks, um, especially like epidemiology that is involving an intervention, like people who do X get Y. I think that epidemiology is absolutely the worst. The next layer of epidemiology that's like less shitty is like looking at IGF levels and contrasting it with disease. Cause at least there you've simplified a variable. You're not trying to figure out like, did those people eat more eggs or less eggs? Like that mm -hmm. becomes a separate question. And I think based on the epidemiology, there's, um, you know, there's a, re there's a U shaped mortality, mortality curve with IGF, um, except it's very skewed. So it's not even a perfect U and, um, I'm having a hard time being convinced by anyone, um, including proponents of very low IGF, that an IGF um, outside of the range of about the 60th to 80th percentile is, is anything but optimal. Mm -hmm. So so there, you know, I've, I've really switched my tune and become a, a little more liberal in what I like to see. Obviously, the two things that, uh, say three things that impact IGF the most are um, amino acid intake. And there are some uh, amino acids like methionine that seem particularly potent. Um, insulin levels indirectly through um, the binding proteins. Um, so therefore, you know, which is largely determined by dietary carbohydrate. And then of course, exogenous hormones like growth hormone, which is obviously very popular in the longevity slash whatever circles. Um, but growth hormone, 
which is an analog. It's the exact uh, analog of the human uh, growth hormone is um, a hormone secreted by the pituitary gland that tells the liver to make more insulin-like growth factor. So um, if a doctor is using IGF, I hope to hell they are monitoring IGF levels. Hmm. If they're using GH, I'm sorry, I misspoke. If they're using GH, I hope they're monitoring IGF levels. And so when you're looking at IGF on a blood test, you're looking at a snapshot, whereas you're living your life as a more of a movie. And for example, <clears throat> I think if we, Walter Longo is probably people think of him as a proponent of low IGF. One of the things that he points out in his FMDs and the studies is that you get the sh shrinking of tissues and organs and the low IGF. And then there's the regeneration, which sort of looks like rejuvenation. I suspect when those tissues and organs are rejuvenating or regenerating, IGF levels aren't necessarily at the floor. That's your rebound. Right. That's where you're actually looking at, you know, synthesis and the other thing. So you're, yeah, you're, I looking, mean, at, you're I mean, looking at an average when you really should be looking at the, the cycling. That, that's right. And I think Longo was influenced by, by his mentor, by the negative effects he saw in his mentor. Um, yeah. And, and felt Walford. that, yeah, yeah. Felt that like, you know, maybe this having low IGF all the time, isn't such a good thing either. Um, again, I don't want to speak for somebody else's views. I, I don't know exactly where, where Longo falls out on that, but, um, but you're right. Um, luckily IGF is much more stable than GH. So people always ask, should we be measuring GH in people? And, and my view is that's sort of like measuring, measuring ACTH which is a, another pituitary hormone that is the one that's um, most responsible for the secretion of cortisol. And unfortunately, the answer is outside of very extreme pathological cases like acromegaly or, you know, pituitary Cushing's disease, very difficult to infer what the hell is going on from looking mm. at those hormones because they are so pulsatile. You know, you go in a sauna for 20 minutes, that's going to change your growth hormone levels significantly, probably won't change your IGF levels as significantly. So, um, the advantage of looking at very high fidelity, high, high frequency moving hormones is great. You're closer to the physiology origin. The drawback is the noise can be too much. 